Now I'm just going to pause and change hats and swap sides. So. <laughs> what I love is that uh, we get to visit um, different churches and every church just has their own way of doing things. And I love that. That's, that's really, really cool. Uh, thank you once again for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak. Caroline and I consider it an honour and a privilege to be able to share with you today. The church at C3 Langford brings greetings, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those who don't know us, um, Caroline and I are itinerant pastors for C3 Langford Church. We have a heart for country ministry to minister to the body of Christ in rural areas. So we're part of the C3 movement, which is Christian City Church, and we're based in Langford. And uh, in our church, Caroline and I serve on the worship team in the sound desk and media area, and I head up the production team for our church that does the live streaming. So usually I'm doing what Tom and Haley are doing up the back there at our place. But many years ago, I gave my heart to the Lord. I had a dream. And uh, Caroline and I were in a country town hall preaching up a storm. And that was way back, actually in the late 80s. It was like 86? Yeah, 86 that we had that dream. In 2003, we had an opportunity to go on a ministry trip to Meriden with the Vineyard Church. You know, I don't know if you guys ever remember that, the Set Me Free 2003. Came up here at the a high school uh, gym. And uh, it was an amazing time for us. And during the preparation for that, God started to talk to us about the shape of country ministry that was on our hearts to do. And so at the Bible study before church this morning, we we're talking about when did God ever tell you to wait? And uh, we were talking about that. Well, that was our waiting time. So we thought well, God was going to get us to do this ministry and we're going to start right away. And it was actually a long time afterwards before that started to gradually unfold. I have a graduate diploma of divinity from Tabor College that I completed around the time of COVID. And in 2019, I was uh, ordained in recognition of the calling that God had placed in our lives. And Caroline was actually ordained last year. So I'm a musician. I love to worship and I play keyboard and guitar and we write music and I hope to publish some songs this year, which will be really good. I'll be meaning to get around to it. And I've been really encouraged to do that. We've got a website, boldlight.com.au which talks about the country ministry that we do, and a little bit about our story and our journey. Last year, we had 10 trips, which is really cool for us. We went to seven different churches, including Kibaling, Meriden, and Northcliffe in York. We travelled over 3,500 kilometres to come and encourage churches. Earlier this year, we took the service in Wagen, and we've been to Northcliffe, and we had Easter Sunday in Kibaling, which was a fantastic time. So our goal this year is 12 trips, one a month, and we're excited to be able to do this. But I became a Christian at Narragin Senior High School when I was in year 11 at the Interschool Christian Fellowship, the ICF. And that was where I met Caroline. First time there, the teacher says, pair off and tell your, each other your life story. And I find myself sitting across from Caroline. It was actually Caroline's first time at the ISF too. She'd been a Christian for a while, but she had never been. And one day she decided that she wanted to go. And that was that God moment that God connected us. We came to Perth to study at Curtin Uni and we joined the Curtin Christian Fellowship. And we did some really big things as part of the Curtin Christian Fellowship. Every year we did an evangelical uh, crusade. Each year there was a theme. One year we snuck in after hours and we planted this huge cross, like three metres tall, in the middle of the quadrangle for the, the students there, just to remind people that we were um, there and Christ was in the middle of them. One year we, we actually went in to the school library, so the uni library, which is a massive building, and we hung this banner, it was like five metres by five metres off the top. It's nine stories nine stories tall, right? I'm terrified of heights. And I'm up there with a guy who does like mountain climbing. He's literally just bouncing off the edge on his toes. I'm going, I can't even look. It was just like that. But we always did things that um, were trying to draw attention to God working. And one of the things that we did regularly was witnessing. You know, you've, you've heard of like witnessing, haven't you? where it was an 80s thing to do. And so what we would do is we would go out among the students two by two and talk about God. And uh, I was there with Mark Illingworth, and some of you may know Mark, and there we would be, uh, Mark and I, we'd be walking around the, the campus and we'd come up to someone and say, hi, I'm Paul, this is Mark, we're both Christians, do you want to talk about God? Now, I don't know what, what it's like around here, but we had some very interesting responses from that. 
you know, it, it went from the um, polite no to the harsh sort of rack off, go away, to the... Um, I can remember one where the lady we were talking to, she said, uh, no, I do not wish to talk about God. We've had discussions about this. And you've got this picture of, like, flying plates at home or something, you know, like there was, there was things and, and stuff thrown around. But to be honest, it wasn't something that I was very comfortable doing. That's just not my thing. I don't like going up to strangers and saying stuff like that. But I believed it was something that we needed to do. And it was really interesting when I was talking with Kevin and Debbie last night about all this. And we sort of commented how some people are really like in your face about God, right? I don't know if you've come across some of those sort of people, the really intense types. And on one hand, I, th I think it's great. But on the other hand, it's like, if you don't exactly believe, if you don't believe exactly what they believe, then they say, oh, you're one of the unsaved. I need to pray for your soul. And it's like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. That's a very strange thing. I don't know, maybe you've met some people like that in your life. But on the flip side, maybe you've actually had a word for God. That you've looked at someone and you, you just know that God wants them to know something. You've got a message for them, but you just don't know quite how to say it to them. I mean, maybe you don't have a problem with that. There are some people that I know that are born evangelists. They have a way of talking with strangers. And in conversation, before you know it, they're committing their lives to Christ. I think that's wonderful. It's really cool uh, seeing that, that happen. It's really impressive. But I'm not like that at all. But I wonder if it's so hard to witness... If it's so hard to tell people the good news, the gospel, why do we do it? I mean, if we're meant to share the message, then why doesn't God help us? Can we understand the heart of God and see that he has actually given us something to help us become a good witness? Is there a way that we can be a messenger for God? That bring, to bring good news and bring that message of hope to the people around us that's natural, that actually comes naturally to us. So that when we talk to people and share, we don't freeze and lock up, that we don't get tongue-tied, but instead the words just flow naturally out of us. Well, I believe that today's gospel reading gives us a keen insight into this issue and that God has indeed authorised us and empowered us to be his witnesses, to allow us to deliver that message to good news to the people around us. Yeah? You reckon? Are you ready here? Okay, before we go into the word, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, open our, our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit so as, as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. We may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So today's reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. And to put that into context, uh, earlier in Luke 24 is the walk to Emmaus, where the two of Jesus' followers are walking to the village of Emmaus after the crucifixion, and Jesus comes alongside them and starts a conversation about recent events. And over the course of the journey, Jesus unpacks the scriptures for them and explains all that the scriptures had said about him. And at the end of their journey, Jesus is revealed and he disappears. And they went back to Jerusalem with the disciples um, and the other followers that were gathered there. And that's where our story picks up today. So Luke 26, verses 36 to 48. Verse 36, just as they were uh, telling about it, as in to all the other um, disciples, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among him, and he said, Peace be with you. But the whole group was terribly frightened, thinking that they were seeing a ghost. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't happen every day, does it? Like, dead people don't just turn up alive, right? I mean, has anyone actually seen that happen? No, not me. It's exceedingly rare that someone was brought back from death to life. So you don't just expect Jesus to turn up like that. I mean, they all witnessed the crucifixion. They saw it all happen. They knew that that man, he was gone. And so then Jesus turns up in the middle of them. Now, I don't know about you, but if it was me, I'd be freaked out, yeah? I remember a skit by a, a group called Isaac Air Freight. Uh, way back when it was called Jerusalem Dragnet and was like done like a detective show and it has this serious introduction that started like this dun, 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 dun. this is the city 
Jerusalem. People live here, people die here. But when they die here and live, that's where I come in. My name's Friday, Good Friday. I carry a badge. And it's just like, hey, I always had this cracked up about, you know, when they die here and live, you know. So how would you respond if something supernatural like this happened to you? I mean, talk about a grand entrance. Jesus just turns up in the midst of them. So we go to verse 38. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why do you doubt who I am? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his feet. So here we have visible and tangible demonstration of the reality of his resurrection. This is it, folks. This really happened. This isn't some ghostly visitation by some departed spirit or something. Jesus' body has been resurrected. He was once dead, but he's alive again. Now, if Jesus were a ghost, you wouldn't be able to touch him. But here he says, touch me. Prove that I'm really here. And just like we were saying in our group in the Bible study before church, um, even Thomas, and Thomas goes, well, Jesus, I, you know, mate, unless I see the holes, unless I put my fingers in there, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus comes and says, well, come on, Thomas, buddy, here we go, have at it. Touch me, prove that I'm really here. So in his resurrected state, Jesus was not an immaterial spirit, but a real, immortal, imperishable body. And this is the hope for us too, because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 37, that believers will receive similar bodies at the final resurrection. So as we see Jesus, that could be us. Verse 41. Still they stood there doubting, filled with joy and wonder, and he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Now, it's really interesting that the Tyndale commentary said that Jesus' appearance was designed to dispel all doubt that he had risen from the dead. And the certainty that the author Luke of the Luke's Gospel desired to build in his readers was rooted in how the Old Testament spoke of the Messiah. So then he goes on in verse 44 and he says this, Jesus said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything that was written about me by Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must all come true. So he mentions three things, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. There are three major sections in the Old Testament, the Bible for the Jews. I mean, they didn't have the New Testament back then. That's just sometime in the future. But for them, they had the Old Testament. And it was the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, the three major parts of the Bible for them. And Jesus is saying here that every part of the Old Testament prophesied about this event. The entire Old Testament points to God's salvation through Christ. Let me say that again. The entire Old Testament points to God's salvation through Christ. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? I listened to a podcast called The Bible Project, and I know we were talking about that this morning. It's a great resource with uh, videos and Bible studies and podcasts. Every podcast finishes with this statement. They say, we believe that the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. A unified story that leads to Jesus. Everything that has been written in the Bible points to Jesus. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand these many scriptures. I must admit, when I read this, I, I just skimmed over and I had to do a double take. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In the Passion Translation, it says it like this. He supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scripture. In the message, it says it like this. He went on to open their understanding of the word of God, showing them how to read their Bibles this way. Here is a statement of unspeakable value. Here is a supernatural event that Christ enables us to understand the scriptures. Christ enables us to understand the scriptures. In the Gospels, we read that Jesus spoke in parables, that he hid the message from, from the people in the stories. But here, the exact opposite is happening. One of the commentaries puts it like this. This statement expresses, on one hand, Christ's immediate access to the human spirit and the absolute power over it. 
to the adjustment of its vision and its permanent rectification of spiritual discernment. It's a very complicated way of saying that he enables us to see and understand the meaning and significance of the scriptures. And not just temporarily, not just for that moment, but from that time forward until now. It is impossible to conceive a stronger evidence of his proper divinity. And on the other hand, making it certain that the manner of interpreting the Old Testament, which the apostles afterward employed, had the direct sanction of Christ himself. In other words, Jesus teaches us how to read the scripture and then gives us permission and authority and shows us a pattern of how we can interpret it. That's really cool. Isn't that cool? So Christ enables us to see and understand the meaning and significance of the scriptures. He teaches us how to read and interpret them. And there's a supernatural element to this where Christ unlocks for us the understanding of God that isn't possible any other way. And maybe you can relate to that, that before you were a believer that you might have read the Bible and go, yeah, that makes sense to me. I don't get it. And you know that people who aren't believers who read this, they go, no, I don't see what you're seeing. And yet somehow when we come to faith, that suddenly it comes alive to us in these words. I, I get goosebumps reading some of this stuff. It's, it's like, wow, it's just amazing. Verse 46. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. So just before our reading today, earlier in Luke 24, verses 13 to 34, we have the Emmaus Road experience. And this account is Luke's most important contribution to the resurrection narrative. And so on the walk to Emmaus, Jesus is correcting the disciples' misunderstanding, showing them from the scripture that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. And then he opened their eyes to the truth of the resurrection. The prophets had written that the Messiah would have to suffer. So the crucifixion did not negate Jesus' identity as the Messiah, but confirmed it because the death of the Messiah was predicted in scripture. So here Jesus is unpacking the scripture for them. He is enabling them to understand what he is saying. He is demonstrating how all along that events happened as they were supposed to happen, as they had been predicted so long ago. Verse 47. With my authority, take this message of repentance to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. If I paraphrase this, I'd say it like this. Jesus is saying, you are authorised, you are instructed, you are commanded to go and do this. Teach, preach and proclaim to all the nations, to everyone, everywhere, starting in Jerusalem and then out to the rest of the world, that there is forgiveness of sins, that there is a restoration of our relationship with God, that we can now have fellowship with him. And that we can have peace. And this is for all who call on Christ as their Lord and Saviour. This is the good news. Amen? Amen? Isn't that cool? This echoes the Great Commission that we read about in Matthew 18, uh, 28, verses 16 to 20, where Jesus says, go out into all the nations. And finally, our last verse for the day, 48. You are witnesses of all these things. So the primary role of the apostles in the book of Acts was to be witnesses to the fulfilment of scripture in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus is saying to the people there, you have seen for yourself with your eyes the reality of what I'm saying. You have experienced for yourself firsthand the power of God. And you can speak from the things that you have seen and experienced. And this is what it means to be a witness. Because you're speaking from the things that you have seen. You're the eyewitness account to the truth of the resurrection. This isn't a rumour. This isn't something that you, you heard third hand. You were right there in the middle of it. Powerful stuff. I was reading at the very end of the Passion Translation. There was a footnote that says this. So ends the glorious gospel of Luke. The one who walked with his friends on his way to Emmaus wants to walk with us. The one who walked with his friends on the way to Emmaus wants to walk with us. May we never walk in sadness or unbelief, for Jesus has risen from the grave and lives victorious as the living God in resurrection life. May you pause here and rejoice. 
believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the only one who will bring us to the Father. Trust in him alone to save you, and you will spend eternity with him. Powerful words. So I can hear you say, Paul, so what? We've talked about witnessing, we've talked about awkward conversations in the 80s, we've talked about skits and detective shows, the supernatural and being messengers. But what does it mean for me? Simply this. Jesus says in verse 47, With my authority, take this message. With my authority, take this message. You must go. In other words, to paraphrase, Jesus says to us, I authorise you to go, to proclaim, to teach and preach. To go into all the nations with this message. We're being given an instruction here to be witnesses to God and messengers of God. So we're witnesses to the power of God. We have experienced the supernatural presence of God in our lives. Even today, we experience forgiveness. Even today, because of God, we've received healing. Even today, our lives have been transformed inside out by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit operating inside us. Yeah? That our lives are different now from when we first believed. Yeah? Before I was a believer, I was like this. But when I came to Christ, something changed in me. And it made me and brought me here to be where I am today. For example, do you think it comes naturally for me to be standing up here in front of a bunch of people? This is not me. I don't like doing this, you know. But it's the power of God working in me that enables me to have the boldness and courage to stand here and proclaim his word. I would much rather be in the back room. I would much rather sit down with a couple of blokes maybe, but not in front of a crowd. But God empowers us. So in Luke's time, they were first-hand witnesses to the death and resurrection of Jesus. They saw it happen and was undeniable. In our time, when we invite Jesus into our hearts, when we come to him in repentance, we experience the power and presence of God firsthand. We know something has changed. And when I heard that gospel message, when I finally realised that God was speaking to me and I needed to come to him, I prayed that prayer of the great exchange and I said, God, I give my life to you and in exchange would you give your life to me, that I choose to live for you and I repent of my sins. And when I had finished praying that prayer way back in high school, I'd realised that something had changed, that something was different and that I had started a journey with Jesus, a journey of faith. This is my testimony. This is my witness. This happened to me and I can talk about it as a first-hand account. So let me ask you this question. What is your testimony? What is your witness? See, we need to know that we have a part to play in all of this, that God could have supernaturally revealed himself to people without us. But the miracle is that God wants to partner with us in sharing the gospel. So he asks you and me to be the message bearers of good news, that we carry that message of good news that brings hope to people, that brings life to people, that brings healing to people. God gives us an opportunity to share that powerful message with those around us. But how does that look? What does that look like? Does that mean going out two by two? Hi, I'm Paul, you know, this is Mark, we want to talk about God. Not always. Let me tell you a story about Grumpy Pete. Now, we have to call him Grumpy Pete because there are two Pete's in his church. There's young Pete and then there's Grumpy Pete. He doesn't want to be called old Pete because he's not old, he's only 86, right? So, you know. Now, Grumpy Pete lived around the corner from the church. And he used to walk past it every day, but he never went in because he knew that if he went inside that the building would cave in, right? Because that's what happens when you're not a believer, right? But we started this thing called Love Langford and it was a community dinner. And so once a week, once a fortnight, we would invite the community to come and have a meal with us. This was not a handout. This is not a soup kitchen. It's come and have dinner with us. And so Pete would walk past and see all the people there. And one time, one of the guys from our home group came out and said to Pete, Pete, do you want to come and have dinner with us? That was it. Do you want to come have dinner with us? So after going to a few of those Love Langford dinners and hanging out with us, he decided that he wanted to come to church. 
right? And then after a while, he joined our home group. And he became part of our home group. And then after a while, he recommitted his life to Christ. Turns out, as a kid, he was like the choir boy in the church. And that he'd actually gone through that, but he'd gone away from God. And here was God calling him back to himself. Sometime after that, he was baptised. And we got to be a part of that. You know, had the baptism pool out the front and we actually had to lift him in because he couldn't do it, he was so old. His life changed, all because one person invited him to come and have dinner. Right? That's how it looks to be a messenger of God. It's been said that sharing the gospel is like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. So we have this message of hope to share with others. We can share our journey with others and we can tell them about the impact that God has had in our lives. We can talk about how God has touched our lives and made something different for us. Pastor Clinton Phillips often said this verse from Revelation. He said that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you too. And maybe for you it's something as simple as saying to someone, come to church with us. Or maybe in a conversation it's like, yeah, that happened to you? Well, that happened to me too. And I prayed about it and God answered my prayer this way. God impacts our lives daily and the supernatural intervention of God should become a normal part of our everyday lives. I remember once I was working at this company and this particular guy I worked with used to really get me wound up. Somehow or other, they used to rub each other the wrong way. And I would come home from work so angry I'd be like white knuckle grip on the steering wheel because of this guy. Like, oh, I really want to just punch him out. I'm so angry. And then one day Caroline said to me, why don't you pray for him? Pray for him? Oh, why would I do that? No, I really think you should pray for him. So I, I go there and I go, God, bless Richard. Oh, just hit him with your Holy Spirit. Just hit him. Just right, pound right into him. But as I started to pray more and more, God started to work on my heart. And I started to see a, a different side to Richard. And he gave me an insight into the lives of others. Prayer changes things. We had lunch with a couple where the wife had recently come to faith. And this is a while ago now. And we got talking about spiritual things. And we talk about how God works in our lives. We talk about how the Holy Spirit works and a little bit about spiritual warfare and how, as believers, we're given authority in Jesus' name. So we don't have to live in fear. But we can be victorious through faith. Because for us, it's just a normal part of life. We're sharing life in the way that God's working with us and all the amazing things that are happening. And at the end of the lunch, she said to us, you know, for Christians, you're the most normal people I know. You know, this is how faith should be. This is how we share God. It just becomes a part of our lives. What did you do on the weekend? Went to church. We talked about God. We looked at this thing. Jesus said this really cool thing. It amazed me. It impacted me. You know. See, God wants us to partner with him in sharing the gospel message. Jesus authorises us to share the good news, to be witnesses to the supernatural power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that power lives in us who have committed our lives to him. I mean, maybe we need to think of it like this. We've got to think of the Australia Post motto, right? Do you remember Australia Post had their logo for a while? They said, we deliver. That's what they do. We deliver. Maybe that should be our motto too, yeah? We deliver. We're not the creator of the message. We're just the messenger. We just deliver the message. This is the message I have for you. So now what? Where do we go from here? We're almost done. Um, what does this look like in your life? If we were to apply this, how can we be the messengers of the good news that Jesus has authorised us to do? And what will it look like for you? And if I could just ask you to close your eyes for a moment. 
And in this time, just ask that God would lay on your heart just one person to share with. Someone that you believe that God wants you to talk to. And with them in your mind's eye, that you would just picture their life situation and the the things that they're struggling with right now. And now let's picture Jesus going to stand with them. And in that moment where Jesus is with them, he's speaking to them and he's saying words. What are those words that Jesus is saying to them? What word of encouragement is Jesus giving them? And maybe the words that Jesus is speaking to them is actually resonating in our life too. So let's pray for our friend right now. God, give us the boldness to speak these words to them. To share the good news and a message of hope that would encourage them. Whether it be simply, I'm praying for you. That God knows your situation and that he's there with you in it. Or that God has a word of encouragement for you and I I just get this picture and I speak this picture out to you. Know that God loves you and cares for you. Father, help us to find that message and hope that would encourage them. Thank you for your word today. Thank you that you have called us, authorised us, commanded us to be messengers of the good news, to be your witnesses to the supernatural power of God in operating in our lives. Give us the boldness to speak your words in your time for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.